This is a new voice for a new Scotland. Welcome to the Indie Pram podcast on IndieLive.radio. My guest this week is Sue Friel, who is a candidate for the SNP for the 2021 general election. A very good day to you, Sue. Hello, Ray. Thanks for having me on your show. That's a pleasure. Thanks very much indeed for coming on. First of all, could you give me some background information about yourself, Sue? Well, for a start, I'm an English Scot. I've lived up here for about 23 years now. I haven't developed the accent yet, but I've certainly grown to love Scotland as my home. I suppose my background is much more of a, a working class background than, than people would think of from my accent. I found out through Ancestry that uh, a couple of generations ago, my great grandfather was actually in the workhouse and my grandparents were a labourer and a servant. And I've not come through the traditional route towards being interested in being active in politics. What brought the interest about? I used to be a, a this is the best way of describing it, is a pedestrian Labour supporter when I was living in England. Very passive. It was it's just the thing to do to vote for Labour and not get actively involved in politics. And then I only really became active when I was anti-independence at the start of the Scottish referendum. Oh, that's good. So you're a no to yes then? I'm a no to yes, and I switched about halfway through the referendum, going from a very hard no, who would cross the street to avoid an SNP stall, to actually putting up a poster in my window and posting things, and actually went out with Martin Day in Linlithgow, so who's our local MP now, knocking on doors to persuade people to vote yes. And the reason I suppose that I changed was I'm from a financial services background work-wise and I was dealing with some clients in the oil industry and I'd set up Google Alerts to give me news on what was happening in the oil industry and I was seeing things about new oil fields, a lot of success happening in the oil industry and then I was reading in the newspapers and in political articles in the newspapers as well about the oil industry going downhill and Scotland was too wee and too poor and the two didn't tie in together. So if industry articles were telling me what I thought was the truth and the mainstream media wasn't, I started questioning everything at that stage. And I think it takes something big like that for someone to move from a hard no over to a maybe and then to a yes. And I went through the maybe thinking that it, w- it was nice for Scotland to become independent, but I didn't think it would be very good for my family in England or the people I knew in England if Scotland became independent. And then after a while, I realised that it would actually set a very good example for my family and relatives in England and show them what was possible. You could have a much better way of governing a country as a separate independent country. So that's really the the journey I took. And I think a lot of people took a similar journey at that point in time, prompted by different things that happened to them personally. But it is very difficult to get a hard no to move over just by talking to them. Well, the media in Scotland, even to this day, which is such a majority against independence it's it's quite a struggle and that's why i feel we've done a phenomenal job with today's breaking news obviously with the business for scotland survey showing support for yes now 55 percent, and we haven't even started campaigning it was amazing actually so there's two polls that came out today so there was the 55 percent from panel base and there was a 54 percent from comres who haven't done polling before which was slightly earlier than the panel based one, but to get two in one day confirming absolutely that yes is ahead and, and the panel based one putting us 10% ahead. Yeah. It's just wonderful, wonderful news. It's great 
base to build on. I think people now are finding within conversation, within the news, that independence has been spoken about so much in relation to 2012 to 2014. We're, we're definitely at a different playing field. I think we are. Um, we've moved away from some of the targeting that was done, certainly of, of Alex Salmond at the time. I, I never used to be able to stand Alex Salmond. I, I thought I believed everything that there was in the media, that he was this smug, self-obsessed man. And the way he was demonised in the media, I think, resonated with a lot of people and they, they believed it. Yeah. Well, we had a perfect um, example this week, of course, with the uh, BBC documentary, which actually missed... It covered everything except for the two days of the defence. Yes, which is a fairly obvious gap, really. <laughs> Considering he won, absolutely. So um, He was found guilty, and I think a trial by TV afterwards is, is not the fairest thing to do, particularly if you're going to miss out the defence case. Yeah. So, you are standing for Falkirk East for the SNP. I'm putting myself forward for selection yes. to be... MP candidate for Falkirk East. Um, Angus MacDonald, who's been the MP there for, for several years, is standing down. Um, he's been a wonderful MSP there. It's a very important constituency. It contains Grangemouth. It's got a, a number of other towns and villages around the, the Falkirk area, including Bonus and the Stenhouse Muir. There's, there's a, a wide variety of towns and villages there. But Grangemouth's economic importance to Scotland, we've got Forth Ports there, and we've got Ineos there. The gross domestic product of Scotland that is represented by those two alone is probably around 17 or 18 percent of GDP. So that there is, there's a huge interest in this particular constituency. It's, it's important to, to Scotland economically, as well as being important to, to me and, and any other candidates um, in terms of the people and the other businesses and the schools and the communities, everything else that's there. Mm -hmm. Begs two questions, two areas I'll cover. The first one is branch-wise. The second point is constituency-wise. What can you bring to the table as far as SNP representation that would encourage more people or more members, because it's the members who will vote for the eventual candidates, what would encourage more people to consider your candidacy as the one to vote for? I have been very, very active on the ground, out there canvassing, leafleting, doing anything I can for, for the SNP and, and also for independence. So although I live just outside the constituency, I can walk to the constituency from my house, I have canvassed and leafleted and attended event fundraising events and things in that constituency on a regular basis over several years now, um, mainly in support of uh, Martin Day, local MP for uh, Lenithgow and East Falkirk. But I have also campaigned for some of the, the councillors. Um, so I do know the area reasonably well, and I am extremely hardworking out there in all weathers, knocking on doors outside obviously of the lockdown and the, the, the current situation that we're in i think we're gonna to have to get more imaginative about canvassing but we'll I'll probably talk about that later on so i'll be very involved with the branches councillors and the mps working together because i think it's quite important that you have a joined up approach across the different different political representatives for the constituency You'll have to work together for the, the, the benefit of all the constituents. Yeah. Now, Falkirk East has been one of the constituencies chosen as a women-only shortlist. What do you feel about women-only shortlists? I would have to say when we discussed it at conference, and it was put to a vote at a conference about where an MSP stood down having a female-only shortlist, now, I don't think anybody at the time at which we voted for that foresaw that we would have nine standing down. So while if it had only been a small number, that might have redressed the slight inequality there. I think with the benefit of hindsight, you probably wouldn't be having all female shortlists now. 
it's it, probably gone too far the other way. Yeah, because with there on some of the very good male candidates who could be putting themselves forward. Yeah, I think a lot of people agreed the fact that we've got to have a we're looking to have a balance of fifty fifty of SNP representatives, but to do it in one step is is quite is quite a jump. I've been listening to uh, quite a few conversations uh, and also reading quite a few conversations and so many women it seems are against all women shortlist it seems to be men don't seem to mind too much but women seem to be the ones who are saying uh, they don't agree which is uh, is quite an interesting situation well i think the the inequality comes in other ways so there has been a tendency i think over the years for when you're in a branch that the men might get put forward more to be candidates and it may be an additional hurdle getting women to to step forward as candidates but I think one of the most fundamental things is the way politics actually operates so although Holyrood is more female and family friendly than Westminster for example it is still difficult for a woman with family perhaps to do that sort of role and there are certain barriers that are inherent there yeah because this has certainly been found from the representatives further north and who have a lot of traveling to do and still got a family to bring up and they can miss out a lot so how does that affect yourself are you have you got a grown-up family i've got two sons so uh, myself and my husband have got um, a 19 year old and a 12 year old going on 53 at times going on two at times <laughs> Yeah. Um, so, yes, we've got family and, and you have to work around your family. I, I, I work at the moment as a freelance project manager, um, so I have to fit in everything, family life, all the other things you have, and politics, yeah. um, being active on, in, in independence and, and active in the SNP and active in English Scots for, for yes. But with all the travelling and all the other things that happen in being an MSP, it is tricky. I can see the barriers that are there for a lot of people where, where, as you say, they've got to travel long distances. And I suppose one of the other things that puts people off is abuse. So online abuse, I, I understand Humza Yusuf possibly has somebody just dealing with all the abuse that he gets on Twitter or something else. I, I, death threats and, and things that I've heard people have must be a barrier to yeah. good people putting themselves forward. Yeah. How do you feel about the uh, suggestion of this new hate crime bill? Because you're going to be asked various questions when it comes to selection, obviously, yeah. when it comes to hustings. So how do you feel yourself? A couple of bills that I think of that are going to come up at hustings. Um, so, for example, the hate crime bill. The hate crime bill, like any bill, is not the actual final legislation. The bill gets put forward, it goes through various processes to get amended before finally being put to a vote and, and getting passed. So the shaping of that legislation is not complete yet. I would have concerns at the moment as to the absence of gender being in there. Sexism is, is, is not in there. It's being specifically excluded because I think I understand they're trying to, to do something around misogyny separately but if you if you look at it say if the urgency is to have this hate crime bill now how long would it take for that other element to happen should we be doing all of it together so I've had a look at the basics of, of that bill at the moment I think there's a lot of work still to be done on it to get it right it's very well intentioned the Scottish people want want fairness above all else, I think, from, from the number of people I've spoken to and having lived here for over 20 years. But it's important to get that legislation right. Certainly as well. I Like yourself, I came from a financial services background, but then went into acting. And obviously within the acting profession, I've also done some, uh, some writing as well and directing. And I can see within the arts that coverage of various points and writing various plays or film, uh, film scripts could step the mark and obviously that's been highlighted by the likes of Elaine C. Smith and others of uh, some of the dangers so 
it's mm -hmm. difficult to write a piece of legislation like that. Yeah. I think we know the power of words and the nuances of different words and how things can be interpreted. Yeah. Because I know, I know some of the lines I've spoken in, in, in films that I've done, you know, that I'll probably be hung and drawn and quartered for, you know, it's crazy. The arts could be affected by such yeah. legislation. Taken on board, though, and there will be further yeah. amendments made. Yeah. And I noticed recently three, about another three candidates just came forward in the last couple of weeks. And looking at Twitter, it was very obvious the question that they were asked immediately it was it was straight in there and i can i looked at it and i thought i feel sorry for any candidate putting their head above the parapet saying i would like to be considered for selection because they're all going to be hit with the same question the gender recognition act whereas many people feel this is really a subject that is it, it's got in the way of independence and really that's what many people after 2014 there was a massive influx to join the SNP to be active and get on the street knock doors talk to people because they wanted the movement to work hard towards independence and you have things that come up which are found to be getting in the way of att attention grabbing and that is one particular piece of legislation that certainly has accomplished that. What's your thoughts? Uh, I'm, again, I'd much rather be talking about independence than the GRA. Um, I think it's important to recognise the fact that we already have a Gender Recognition Act and it's talking about amendments mm -hmm. to that act. I've been absolutely horrified at the way things have become polarised. Yep. The abuse at both ends of this spectrum. I it's agree. Yeah, I completely agree. Because it hasn't been one-sided and that's where we feel, well, certainly I feel, you shouldn't be disrespecting another member. Just yeah. equally be respectful of each other. But when, when it's loaded both sides, it's get, it's get in the way of the conversation. And that's when I saw these three... Uh, applicants come forward and I thought wow straight away people were hitting in so it's it's not going to go away you know um, unfortunately. There are some points made on both sides when you dig through all the abuse there are some valid points mm -hmm. on, on both sides that need to be considered yeah and the temptation is to throw them all into a room to listen to each other's point of view and try and understand and find a way forward that is fair. Yeah. I think a lot of people, Sue, feel that even just asking a question, when you're asking a question just to understand the point, the problem is being that when you ask a question, then you can be accused of being transphobic. Independence is really important. Fairness in society is also very important, and I can understand the emotions behind this. But we were given two ears and one mouth, and we should be listening twice as much as we actually speak. And I think that's what's missing here is the, the listening and trying to understand each other. So do you feel it should be on the back burner for a while, let the independence take over? My personal view, I mean, the reason they're, they're trying to do the amendments on the GRA at the moment is amendments have happened in other countries, and it's to bring things in line with, with the changes that have happened elsewhere, increased rights for, for trans people. Is it urgent right now? Probably not, but if you're a trans person, it probably is very urgent to you. So, and the commitment's being, get, being given there to do this, so. Well, that's, that's it, Sue, that, it's one area I wish you and all the fellow candidates success, I because I think it's. it's because you're talking about people's rights. And yeah, absolutely. It, yeah. Very right. Question was going to ask uh, before that um, I held, held back was what you can do for your branch. Now, what can what do you see yourself being if you're if you're chosen as a candidate? What would you be able to do for your constituency? I think there's a, a couple of things I would bring to the constituency. Partly my understanding of business 
to a degree from my financial background dealing with a lot of businesses. Bringing jobs and investment into the area, I would work really hard um, because I've, I'm from my background where I've also been chair of a local um, climate change charity, Transition and Earthgo. I know that we need to transition to a much lower carbon society. We need to have more new sustainable jobs. And bringing employment and the jobs of the future to the constituency is something that's very important to me. Particularly you know, young people in, in the current environment, there could be young people jobless for two or three years once they come out of university or, or, or even now. Um, with what's happening to the economy, both as a combination of COVID-19 and Brexit. So there's a lot of things that need to be done, early intervention on these things. We, we need to look to the future. What are the jobs and industries of the future? How do people need to work in the future? You know, remote working, other ways of working that we can, we can all share in. I think that other things that I could bring is listening, being active, um, in a previous role as a, a, a union official, I was involved in very heavily in listening to issues, campaigning for uh, changes to take place, taking up people's personal cases, which is obviously a part of a, an MSP's job. You know, people have got an issue about something, they need help listening and helping them. And one thing I've learned from uh, my local MSP uh, Fiona Hislop and from Martin Day is that people matter. And then it doesn't matter whether the constituent is an SNP supporter or not. You represent all of them and you value all of them equally. With powers being threatened by the Westminster grab with uh, powers that should have be come from Brussels to here, what sort of impact do you think that would have on an MSP's job? It will change what Holyrood is technically able to do. I believe that there are some other routes to us achieving some of the things that we would like to do. This, this internal market idea that they've, they've come up with now is a, an initial means to try and uh, take back some of the powers. We know that the SNP government is looking to, to fight those tooth and nail. Now, there can be legal challenges, there can be any number of ways that we can fight against these measures. Obviously, the most, most interesting one for most of your listeners is probably going to be going for independence by whatever route we can achieve that in the shortest time frame possible. Well, whatever we do, we've got to carry the population of Scotland with us. Are you in favour of a more gradual route or... Uh, a more positive move. I would have to say that I think the momentum is with us to have a more positive route, to be honest. I think the Scottish Government, the SNP and the Greens together have demonstrated that Scotland can run its affairs properly with the limited powers that have been granted, have done demonstrably better than the, the UK government in recent times. People in England are saying they wish that Nicola Sturgeon was Prime Minister. It is so obvious that we can do better running our own country. So I, I, th I think the momentum is there. It is how we now act in pushing to get that 55% up to the 60% because no matter what we do, we're going to need international support. They're going to have to back us up and say, yes, Scotland, you're doing the right thing. We value, we understand you've got the, the Scottish people behind you. Therefore, we recognise you as an independent country. We recognise your right to have had that referendum or whatever route you've taken to independence. Looking at legislation that you can pass in Parliament? Uh, any particular challenges that you would like to fight for yourself that hasn't been addressed that you would like to raise at uh, branch level as a proposal for conference and bring to the fore? Well, there's a number of things that are already under discussion that I'm 
really, really interested in. So, you know, universal basic income, for yep. example. I think that is, that is fundamental. And moving to a, a, a well-being based economy, not constantly focusing on GDP, because what does GDP growth favour? It favours those who have got the most. It favours big business. It favours the very rich. Whereas if we go focus on a well-being economy and look at everybody benefiting the best that we can, I think that's going to be a much better way of running a country. Mm -hmm. Did you take part in the National Assembly? Yes, when I was able to, yes, because I was working as well at the same time time so yes it was very interesting yeah I, I took part in three days of it uh, in, in the three days and it was certainly a great platform and going forward I think that would be a platform to use as well for conference even though with a pandemic period like we're living through just now and uh, because there's so much less need for traveling and accommodation that people can still take an active role in it I found it was a very good platform indeed going forward I think it's, it's a good to use digital means. I think one thing to be aware of, though, is not everyone has access to these things. So potentially excluding people from poorer households or maybe some people who have not been able to get access to the technology if they've got certain types of disability to participate. So maybe they have different technology available to them. Yeah. Talking about Ineos and petroleum industry, obviously going forward, there's obviously decades and decades and decades of oil still under the, the sea. But our need for it will be reducing over time as we use more environmentally friendly fuels for transportation, whether it's uh, wave power, hydropower, wind power. Do you feel that's something that needs attention in your constituency uh, for the future in case it does cause a downturn in the requirements for the workforce in the Grange Mountain area for refining? I think it's when you look towards the new, the industries of the future. So in renewables, you're already getting companies setting up in renewables in the area. And I think that's going to be a growth area. So there are lots of alternative industries that are going to to come forward. Similarly, now we take the retail industry, that's having to change as a result of lockdown. You know, lots of shops, the face to face, the interactions that you have, people have discovered they, they can go online and, and there's less demand for normal retail shops. So things are going to continue to change and develop, but there's always something new that comes up to replace it. And we need to look at what those trends are and plan for them ahead of time. Another massive important thing for an imp independent Scotland is our trade with Europe and the rest of the world. The Firth of Forth is blessed with very good docking areas for transport. How would you like to see that developed or improved, especially within your Falkirk East constituency? I, I do firmly believe that we need to have our own ports exporting on our behalf. This this nonsense about everything, well, I think Margaret Thatcher shut down our ability to export from our, our docks in Scotland. This nonsense, everything goes through English ports and counts as English exports. It's, it's, it's caused a lot of problems. And also, if you look at it from an environmental point of view, why take things down by trucks and lorries to the south coast of England mm -hmm. using, creating lots of pollution yep. when they could just be put on the boat up here. Yeah. It's just crazy. So anything else on the climate change aspect that you would, uh, that you've been active in and that, that you would like to see? No, it's, it's moving to a more circular economy. So at the moment, if we have grown into very disposable throwaway society you see that most often in in fast fashion it probably affects you slightly less i think men statistically tend to buy less clothing per annum than a woman does i'd agree and that, sexist, that is based on on statistics i can't quote the actual sources right now but the, the tendency is you go into a shop by and large 
the fabrics that are used are ones that aren't designed to last very long. Yep. And they get thrown away very quickly. What we need to move to is things that can be repaired, things that are going to last for a good long time, pay more for better quality things, teach people how to reuse things. So one of the things that we had was uh, we ran upcycling classes. So you could take an old pair of jeans and, and turn it into a new bag, or you could you can do different things. And I think the more we can teach people how to appreciate things made from the resources, the limited resources we have in this world, the better life is going to be. Well, Falkirk, as you explained, it's quite a balanced constituency. But how many food banks do you have? There are a few. Uh, I understand that they're becoming slightly less this week, or the branches of the food banks are decreasing slightly because there was an increase during coronavirus, during the lockdown period for people shielding. So there was a lot of uh, extra effort that went into that, but I can see the food bank use growing because come this autumn, the economy is going to deteriorate further. People are, more people are going to be out of work because you're going to get the furlough benefits ending. And that's when a lot of employers are going to go, I'm not going to keep these staff anymore. I'm going to let them go. You're already seeing a lot of redundancies happening in the retail sector. I think potentially in England, in the north of England, there could be riots, yeah, particularly in, in what was the old Red Belt, where they voted Tory. Well, the biggest surprise to me was actually those who voted in Sunderland voted to leave the EU. Yeah. <laughs> I thought, wow. <laughs> because I, I'm just waiting for Nissan to actually close that announce that they, they are closing that plant down. I thought, whoa, talk about shooting yourself in the foot. Question I would like to ask because of, uh, is in relation to standing as a candidate. How would you encourage others? It is difficult to get people to stand. There are people who will naturally put themselves forward, and some of that comes from the the branch officers. There's, sometimes it's it's seen that there's a natural route to getting to be a local candidate. You you have to be in this role in the branch, and then that role in the branch, and then you earn your, your stripes to, to move up to becoming a, a councillor or, or whatever else. I think we need to not throw that up totally out of the window because it is good for, for some people to come from that route. But the reason I'm standing is because I really, really want independence. I want it now, to be honest. And I want to be part of trying to get that delivered in the next parliament. It's, the, it's got to be delivered in the next parliament. Yeah. Uh, how do you stand on the currency? Would you like a currency from day one or would you prefer to use sterling for two or three years until six tests are passed? I would rather not use sterling. I think we're going to end up being having our currency being on a par with sterling, would be my personal view, for a year or two, pegged to it. Potentially, while we get the central bank set up and, and, and the other institutions set up that we must have, because you have to be able to do that borrowing. If you look, if you were in that current situation as an independent country, we would be doing the borrowing that Westminster is currently doing, and then having the ability to choose how we're spending that money that we've borrowed. We're not getting that choice at the moment, but we're still involved in that borrowing and is deemed to be Scotland's debt. Would you agree with Kenny McCaskill that we still haven't got answers insofar as things like currency it's a difficult question to answer that one and the reason i'm saying that is because some of the questions almost don't matter when mm -hmm. it comes to voting for independence and just to explain that a bit more so say on currency on the set on the day after we vote for independence is anything really going to change are we going to be going to stop using it Pound coins. No, we're going to have a transition period. There will be a transition period. Mm -hmm. And the question is, who decides whether we have our own currency or not? Do you leave it until after we said, yes, we're going to be independent, right? Let's have a vote on, well, let's have a consultation on currency and a couple of other things that need to get ironed out. Or do we have to go into the referendum with all those things decided? No. 
And I don't think we do have no. to go into a referendum. No, I would agree. I, I agree with you. Yeah. You said you were in the English shops for yes. How active have you been and how did you find the activity that you've partaken in and also what sort of reception did you find? English Gods for Yes, I think, first came to my attention. I, it, it was in Dumfries and Galloway where you had the banner appearing there and everyone taking notice of it. Hang on, it's not anti-English. So one of the drivers for me joining English Gods for Yes was to be part of that, to go, independence is not anti-English. It's about Scotland and about Scotland's right to determine its own future. And I think the more English people that join that and promote it, the better. I have not found, since I've lived in Scotland for about 23 years, I've not found anti-English sentiment. I've encountered the obvious sexism, which exists throughout the UK, but I've not found anti-English settlement sentiment with one very minor humorous exception which is when I attended an international football match at Easter Road. England weren't playing, but at half time they stood up and sang, stand up if you hate the English. But that's the only example that I have ever come across. Yeah. I've... And that was intended yeah. that way. Yeah. I've never experienced it. You know, I've lived here 43 years. Well, Sue, I wish you luck for your selection, uh, best of luck, and should you make it uh, then through that and then elected, uh, look forward to speaking to you as an MSP and all the very best for the future. Thank you very much, Ray. It's been a pleasure. Indy proud, yes, Indy proud, on Indy Live Radio. Indy proud. This is a new voice for a new Scotland. And in life, radio.